the the United States is now officially roughly half in poverty. I mean, we haven't been this bad off in a long, long time. Is it time to revisit Franklin Roosevelt's second Bill of Rights? FDR's second Bill of Rights, very straightforward. I'll play the audio for you a little later on, but just a, a, a quick snapshot. He said that uh, everyone should have the right to a job and a fair wage. In other words, when capitalism fails or hiccups, as it peri- periodically does, it's called the business cycle, uh, the government should be the employer of last resort. Franklin Roosevelt said the best welfare program is a job. Number two, farmers should be fair to, paid a fair price for their work, which in this modern day means get the speculators, people who are not actually counterparties to a trade, out of the, out of the speculating business. Number three, businesses should be free from monopoly. <laughs> Good luck on that. America used to be a nation full of small businesses. You, you, you could drop into any city in America, look around, and know exactly where you were because before Reagan stopped enforcing the Sherman Antitrust Act in 1982, America was a nation of small businesses. Now every industry is dominated by two, three, four companies. I end number five. Franklin Roosevelt said we should have the right to health care. Not the privilege, the right. And number six, he said that we should have the right to a safety net, old age unemployment economic security. Old age, excuse me, old age economic security and unemployment economic security. Number seven uh, of his Bill of Rights that everybody should have the right to an education. In other words, we invest in our our intellectual infrastructure all the way through college. And he said, if we do this, he said an old an old uh, British judge once said, a necessitous man is not a free man. If we do this, if if we are no longer necessitous, if we are no longer hungry or homeless or uneducated or unable to find a job or unable to get health care when we need it or living in poverty and living on cat food in our old age, then we are free. That in any of those circumstances, you are not free. Tom Pawkin has some specific thoughts on this. He is the Republican candidate for governor of Texas, former state chair of the Texas Republican Party and the Texas Workforce Commission. He's the author of Bringing America Home, and his website is Tom Pawkin. It's spelled P-A-U-K-E-N, for F-O-R, Texas.com. Tom, welcome welcome back to the program. Tom, good to be back with you. Thank you for joining us. And, and uh, oh, and by the way, I, should, I, I wanted to mention at the top of the show, today is the 45th anniversary of the death of Robert F. Kennedy, who I think would have taken our nation in a far more progressive direction had he lived. Um, your thoughts on Franklin Roosevelt's second Bill of Rights? Well, my my thoughts are uh, twofold, really. The uh, the point you're making about people are, are, are not getting employed, they're not getting good middle-class jobs. Uh, to borrow a phrase from my uh, friend, the late Congressman Jack Kemp, who took it from John F. Kennedy, a rising tide lifts all boats. You've got to have a vibrant private sector in order to pay for our government benefits and services, and we got a tax system in place that puts the financial engineers in charge and is a killer for small businesses and U.S. manufacturers because it rewards debt while punitively taxing capital investment, uh, employment, and savings here in the U.S. You need to reverse that. We're exporting prosperity and American jobs beho- uh, overseas. Now, respectfully, and, uh, you've got your metaphor upside down or backwards. Um, the, the, the rising tide that lifts all boats is the tide of infrastructure. It's the tide of, uh, of a good public education provided everybody by the government. John but, Kennedy but, talked but, about but, we're paying pays, three quarters of the cost of all new hospitals and schools. We're building but, but, roads. Tom, who pays for it if you don't have, if you've got a stagnant private sector, you can't pay for your government benefits and services. The reason companies are moving to China instead of to Burma is because China went ahead and made their in their investment in their in their physical infrastructure. You can get you can take a high speed train across China right now, the the same distance as Chicago to New York in about nine hours. You can't do that in the United States. Companies are looking at China going, this is pretty cool. We'll work I beg, here. I beg, I beg to disagree with you because you've got a huge tax advantage that China, Germany Germany, which has a high wage and labor costs, is uh, 
got a strong manufacturing sector, but they've got a 17% or actually a 19% tax advantage over us because they have a border-adjusted consumption tax. And what I favor is getting rid of our corporate tax, which is 35% and 7.65 employer portion of the payroll tax, replacing it with a border-adjusted consumption tax. You could do it at 8 to 9%, so all goods and services coming into the U.S. are taxed at their uh, at, at that price, and uh, and all exports get a tax credit against their business consumption tax, and provide incentives for companies that have that money parked overseas to bring it home by allowing them, as long as they put it into capital investment, to expense it against their revenues. Okay, so, you're you're aggregating a whole bunch of different things, but with right. regard to uh, German corporations, German corporations pay a higher tax. They they they're not faced with a higher tax rate but they pay a higher effective tax rate than the United States, than the U.S. corporations. We're second, I dis- I disagree second with lowest among the OECD it- nations. No, look at it. It's on the OECD website. Um, no, we are, no, I've seen it. We're I mean, number two I, from the bottom. They have a lower corporate tax rate than we do. They have a lower yeah, corporate tax rate, but that's not what corporations pay. Corporations in America buy politicians well, who, who build yeah, loopholes I, into the I tax concur. code. I and General Electric pays nothing, and they've shipped a lot of jobs overseas. If you go to a border-adjusted consumption tax at 8 or 9%, all of a sudden, General Electric, every, nobody can game the system anymore. No, this Everybody is where I agree with you. If you're talking about a VAT tax that's reversible yeah. at the borders, which right. is how Germany does it, it's such a Japan does it, it's how South Korea does it, sure. it's how China does China it. China does it. Um, then, then, yes, we should do that. But good luck telling any Republican anywhere in this country that you want to add a new tax. No, you're going to get rid of the other tax, and then the IRS won't be uh, doing what they're doing now, which is uh, targeting conservative groups of a variety of fronts. You can replace the corporate tax, income tax, the IRS is not targeting consumption tax, at least get IRS out of business affairs. The... Uh, well, the IRS would be would be managing your consumption tax. And the second thing I would do is, uh, I think it's just the opposite of growing government. I think the mood is out there of decentralization of government. I think that, particularly with the concentration of power, and I'm not talking about just Roosevelt or LBJ or Nixon. Uh, Bush did it with what they call big government conservatism, which I call an oxymoron. Obama administration's done it. Why not go back towards decentralization, have the federal money... Uh, go back to the states and local communities on a pro rata equitable basis and let people in California or Texas or wherever decide how to take care of the people in their states. So if somebody is born in West Virginia, if they have the, if they have the, uh, the misfortune of being born into a poor family in a f- poor state, tough luck, Charlie. No, not at all. I mean, West Virginia, you don't have, you got this, you go to, you've been to Washington, Tom. You're in and out of there all the time. I live in Washington. Uh, that is, that is a uh, recession proof society. They, yes. You've got this huge bureaucracy. And I see even among Democrats and independents, I mean, I see it on the education front. There's just so much frustration that all the power is being centralized in Washington. And I'm simply saying, send, send the money back to West Virginia or California or Texas and let the people on a pro rata equitable basis determine well the, pro- the take care of their people their poor people their okay. best Tom I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to leave you with the last word right there and not even rebut it Tom Pawkins.